I wish to introduce Chris Malmsley. He's the Communications Director of the UK Libertarian Party. He's also uh, the Devil's Kitchen, a, a very notable and entertained blogger in this country. And his presentation will be on the UK Libertarian Party, a showcase presentation. And I want to say now for the record, and Tim and I have said this repeatedly, when the Libertarian Party started a couple of years ago, some people thought that it would be in uh, competition with the Libertarian Alliance. Now, we personally, Tim and I, have never thought that. The Libertarian Alliance exists for one particular purpose. The UK Libertarian Party exists for another purpose. Our uh, particular circles do not necessarily touch, uh, except so far as we do render each other such assistance as may be necessary in the circumstances. And so there is a Libertarian Party and a Libertarian Alliance. They're not the same organisation, but we work together in the closest harmony. And on behalf of the Libertarian Alliance and the Libertarian International, I wish to introduce Chris Mounsey. Chris. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I, I feel slightly out of place, place amongst all the intellectual people who are, who are on the programme today, but um, I shall try and entertain you at least. Um, just as a quick aside, I, someone from my blog sent me, they said, well, I want to send you a book that one of my companies publishes. Uh, I said, okay, great, that's fantastic. And uh, the book is called Politicians I Met in Light. And uh, it's a complete blank notebook. <laughs> <laughs> great thing. Uh, <coughs> So, yes, the Libertarian Party, um, that's basically who I am. Um, yes, I, I write a blog, and it's quite important that I write a blog, because that's how the Libertarian Party came about. Um, for those of you who do know my blog, I shall try and keep swearing to a minimum. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is the basic agenda. I thought talk about uh, how the party came about, uh, what our initial strategy was, how it's developed over time, a little bit about our manifesto, not going to go into massive detail, but you know, obviously you'd like to know kind of what we're standing for, uh, how we've done and what we intend to do in the future. Um, so basically it all came about through a, blog, a post on a blog by a guy called Guthrum, um, uh, who basically listed a whole load of things that the new Labour had introduced in terms of the liberal laws and said, look, something's got to be done uh, and does anyone want to join me in doing something about it? So uh, a number of us contacted him and that was the, the actual genesis of the party. Um, and it has gone through blogs the whole time. It's quite an interesting thing. I mean, the five of us who, who founded the party uh, have probably been in the same room together on maybe four occasions. Um, everything else has been done online, which is one of the challenges we've also faced in trying to get the party off the ground. Um, why a political party? Because we want to try and answer the question of what in practical terms would a libertarian state look like? As a libertarian blogger, the, the comments that I get quite often are, oh, well, of course, libertarian is just a fantasy, isn't it? You know, you can have your philosophical purity, but it never actually happened. You know, what could a libertarian society look like? So we thought we'd try and, you know, one of the things about the political party would be to try and answer that question. You know, practically, what laws do you have? Uh, what do you try and introduce? Um, and also because we actually wanted to vote for a libertarian option. Uh, we wanted to give other people the opportunity to do that. Uh, and frankly, I was fed up with holding my nose or putting on a pair of Polly's nose pegs and you know, voting for the Conservatives. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so five original founders, views ranging from anarcho libertarian, very much so on uh, at least one side, to sort of consequentialist minicus. Um, it was very much herding cats in those early days. We tried to get, you know, come to grips with, come to terms with each other's uh, philosophies as well. But, um, the essential thing is that, you know, what, well, the reason it worked in that case was because you know, the anarcho libertarian was very much, um, you, know, you know, we must have political and philosophical purity. Um, whereas the consequentialists were more, well, actually, we've got to try and have something that people are actually going to vote for, and there's quite enough balance to keep that. Um, so we were officially launched in January 1st, 2008, so quite young. Um, the idea was to have a very small organisational core, um, literally, was the five of us, and we had a very unlibertarian grip on the party when it started. Partly because we didn't want to end up with the UKIP situation, where you have constant splits and infighting. And so we wanted to try and actually make sure it built up in a, in a reasonably sustainable way. And we were quite prepared to sit there and build it and build it very, very slowly over five or ten years. I mean, we, you know, it's one of those things, if you're starting a new political party, you've got to be in it for the long term, really. Especially with the Libertarian Party and you know, the general 
you know, status consensus is going to be very unlikely to let you get in wherever they possibly can avoid it. Um, so the idea is to you know, have a gradual development, gradual loosening uh, uh, of, the, of the party structure. Um, Education-wise, the idea was to try and go in to do, uh, talk to people at um, universities or colleges, which we've done a few times. That's mainly what I do, um, and I've done a couple of uh, couple of uh, new places. That I've done some Cambridge, and we did, we did a debate at uh, Oxford, and you know, in a farmer college, and I'm doing Warwick, and those kind of things. So you know, we'd start to get people there, and they had good turnouts, and that's been you know, a lot of fun. Um, and the important thing, of course, is development of the manifesto. Of course, we came out. We came about a, a sort of online forum, uh, and we're you know, geographically scattered. And as the party built and got members, they tend to be geographically scattered. Um, the idea was to uh, to actually use the internet you know, to actually develop uh, the uh, the policies themselves. So the way that we did this was we had a basic manifesto, which the five of us came up with you know, reasonable policy positions on on each of the main areas, and then we released them into the forum uh, online. Uh, and this, uh, at this point, we were, of course, you know, trying to get people to join the forums, uh, and we opened up for debate. You know, what do you think our policy should be? Have we got this bit right? You know, do, you, just, do you want to go into detail? Trying to, if you like, harness the, the, the wisdom of the crowds, i.e., that you know, people you know, who were lawyers, for instance, might have a better idea of how a law might be drafted, or, or of you know, what existing laws there are, because after all, there are so many now, uh, it's difficult to know exactly where to start on repeating anything. Um, so the idea is to be consequentious, minicus and flavour. So the idea of what I mean by that is it's got to be practical. Um, whilst the philosophy obviously would be to have a totally free society, um, there are practicalities to put into this. I mean, you know, but our basic position is that there is probably a need for a state. Um, it probably should be defence and law, uh, but how do we move towards that? How do we actually manage the transition, which is quite a, a difficult thing to do. Um, so initially the forums were open to all commenters, uh, not to party members. Anyone who wanted to join in for discussion was you know, entirely open. Later on we had to close that because we just couldn't police it and we thought, well, you know, if a journalist wants to get in there and there's someone, some dude ranting uh, about something that's entirely uh, you know, off topic, um, as we had started to get quite a lot, uh, and it was going to be an issue, so we, started, we closed that down the end. Now it's open to party members and we still develop the policy on the forums in party members. <coughs> So, obviously, so we talked about you know, the gradual development of the party. So, we've now quite decentralised power quite a lot uh, from, from the NCC. Um, you know, we have a day to day running of stuff where you know, we each do our own individual parts, um, and of course, we have to keep to the, all of the laws. There's an incredible amount of red tape in setting up a political party, uh, and there are incredible um, costs as well. Uh, and we don't have enough money to pay people to do these things, so it's all done in our spare time. Uh, in addition, uh, because you know, the, the cost of the, for instance, um, our, our, our president, our chairman, uh, uh, is a self employed uh, company man. And because he's also the head of a political party, his company has to pay £900 because he's a, a liability, a risk, apparently. Which is just one of those costs which is uh, you know, trying to stifle small parties. Um, so we've now got branches set up I mean, in the South East, particularly good branches, we've got South West, North West, basically going through the old kingdoms wise, as it were. Uh, and those are really starting to take off now, and they're really going on to sort of local autonomous campaigning uh, and very much going towards an independent funding model to actually try and decentralise power right down to, to the local level. Um, and the big challenge for us, of course, is trying to move from online into the real world, actually getting people together and saying, you know, actually going out and campaigning is always a difficult one. People are perfectly happy to sit ranting on blogs from the comfort of their own sitting room. Uh, but actually going out in the rain, stomping around houses, putting leaflets through doors is usually a bit more difficult to get people there. Um, so, the long term ideals, obviously, is, you know, we'd, they're pretty much libertarian ideals, you know, free society, protective sex and liberties, um, and uh, rule of law, and obviously voluntary relationships as far as we possibly can. Um, but again, you know, all of this is you know, it's going to have to be managed in the transition. I mean, we talk about, for instance, you know, private charitable donations could replace the welfare state, but people got out of the habit of going to charity in a great deal of ways. Certainly, the kind of level that they did, for instance, um, you know, when the sort of seven great hospitals of London were all built by private charity and private subscription. Um, you know, we, people have got out of that, that, that habit now, partly because we've been taxed so heavily. So, there's got to be a transition managed whereby if we abolish tax tomorrow, people won't just start giving all the money they would have paid to the state to charities. Um, but you know, so you've got to try and, in some way, get a transition there. It's not, you know, not going to happen overnight. So the short-term goals. Um, 
So the basic manifesto policy positions we have, you know, obviously appeal of unprecedented unnecessary contradictory discrimination with legislation. Um, looking at the Bill of Rights, Magna Carta, and returning to the idea of common law, moving more and more towards the Roman law style um, that the EU wants to impose, and you know, the idea of you know, just a common law where you have a complainant, and then you can have a look at the, you know, at the, uh, at the case in court. Um, so the economy, I say the ideal of free trade, because if we accept that there has to be a state of some sort, uh, you're going to have to have taxes and taxes are going to be distortion, so it's not really free trade. Um, but that's the ideal we want to go towards, of course. Um, one of our positions was to try and uh, move away from income taxes, um, so you can do the money, you know, what you want. Um, and we wanted to, I mean, when we, uh, so our first policy position was to abolish income tax, uh, as we know, which will be paid for by the abolition of quangos. Uh, income tax has raised about 150 uh, billion, uh, roughly speaking, and to abolish the quangos that don't include the NHS <coughs> would be a, you know, about, would, would pay for that policy if you want to go in those terms. Quangos at the moment spend about 250 billion pounds every year, uh, and some are PCTs that deal with the health service, but a lot of them are things like you know, the Milk Marketing Board, the Potato Development Council does actually exist and spend 40 million pounds of money every year, um, which. Uh, I think probably is a waste of money if the potato, you know, if potato farmers want some kind of development around about potatoes, maybe they should pay for them. Um, that's, uh, that's one of the things. So we want to go towards local sales taxes. Um, and local sales taxes are roughly speaking on luxury. So you, you, know, you can't prevent people saying, oh, well, yeah, you're gonna, you know, people won't be able to buy food. So actually, unprocessed food, as you have a VAT now, um, you know, is a zero VAT basis. So you have luxuries, you know, tax and luxuries. It's the nearest you can possibly get, I think, to a voluntary tax. Um, because you say, well, you don't have to buy a new hi-fi, but if you do, okay, you have some tax. So it's, it's, it's kind of ideal that you have that. Um, health, obviously moving towards a, a private payer system. Um, you know, again, it's one of those difficult ones. People get so very, very head up about the NHS, you know, we've got it now. Um, and uh, there have been various proposals about how you move away, practically speaking. Um, I think Richard Wellings wrote um, a quite good blog on the IEA blog, um, a couple of days ago about how you might manage that transition, uh, which frankly we've pinched. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, use the wisdom of the crowds, as I said. Um, it's always good ones to try and do. Education is, is I think, a simple attitude. It's, 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 the free, it's the Swedish free schools model. It's a voucher model. Um, and I am set up a, you know, a school. Uh, it's going to a private thing. It, it's a great idea because you, you, you abolish all these things like catchment areas and you allow schools to compete with each other. It's one of the things that Cameron's slightly moving towards, but seems to have missed the point that you've got to allow schools to compete with each other. Um, it's going, yes, we're going to have voucher systems, we're going, great, but so what? It's just paying things to schools in other ways. If we don't ask schools to compete, if we don't ask schools to start up, then you're just keeping the same moribund system. You're sort of coming kind of in halfway there and not quite getting the whole thing. He's missed the complete point of it. Um, so very much this is where we go towards. Because the outcomes are so much better. Um, I mean, the, currently, according to, if you look at Nation Master Statistics, which is great, it compares statistics from countries all over the world. At the moment, 50.4% uh, of the adult population in this country has low literacy, uh, which means that, you know, and we've got something like 20% of the population are functionally illiterate. In some areas, it's even higher than that. I mean, I, I, I've moaned in my professional life, I'm dealing with a housing association in Wales, where they reckon they've got illiteracy rates of over 50%. People who cannot actually read and write, um, which is pretty shaming, I think, um, for, you know, for such a, uh, for such a you know, for the fourth world's well, fourth largest economy, we can't actually have people who can read and write. Um, so defense, obviously, is you know, to start a pra pragmatic armed neutrality. We don't get involved in other people's wars. Um, you know, we, we keep ourselves to ourselves. Right? We don't believe that you know, we have any right to force democracy on, any, on anyone. Um, and, uh, but we just have armed forces for you know, if we are attacked. It's the other thing of not, not, non-aggression vaccine is kind of important. Um, immigration points-based system in the short term, <coughs> trying to uh, uh, handle things. Um, and then on reduction of the welfare state, open borders, um, and based, possibly based on bilateral agreements with other nations. Um, you know, there is, a, there's a, there is a good libertarian argument saying that if you have a welfare state, then open borders is not necessarily a practical way to go. Um, and I, but I think we want to be moving towards that as soon as possible. Uh, but again, I have a, a personal, <laughs> personal statement. Um, 
But most, most importantly, whatever sides do, we should be, the UK government's policy, we should be able to decide, or the people should be able to decide what has to do with immigration. Which, as you know from the EU, we don't like that. Uh, well, that's a tricky one, uh, always. Um, obviously, it's encouraged self-reliance and charitable works. As I said, though, you have to manage that transition. You're not going to get people to do that immediately. Um, but one thing is, you know, no funny lifestyle choices. So basically, you know, we have a position where we are now, and we basically say, if you have, for instance, more children, you're not getting more benefits for those children. It's a lifestyle choice, and we don't believe we should be paying for it. Um, Housing planning, simple planning laws, abolish stamp duty and cost of purchase orders, but we're retaining zoning for the short term. The the idea is just to have some little bit of control which then they can go as well. It's managing again, it's managing transition stuff. But hopefully you simplify planning laws and you take away a lot of the expense, you will end up with more development and things become a lot less expensive, you know, especially property you know, in terms of you know, houses rather than national land housing. Um, transport is uh, fairly easy, I think, that we uh, speed cameras don't do any good, so we'll remove those. Um, why not the insurance certificate? Um, the simple thing is that if the insurer feels that your car is not roadworthy, they won't insure it. So why do we need to state actually uh, sitting there saying, right, we have to have this MOT? Um, resolving rail franchises. This is an interesting one, which is still currently under debate, and do feel free to you know, come to me with any ideas you have for this. Um, my contention is that railways are not privatised right now. Uh, because the state runs the tracks, the state controls how long the franchises are there for, and generally speaking, what's happening is that the private providers are just running a service for the state. It's a bit like PFI in hospitals, you know, they run, they just run the hospital. Um, I don't think rail is privatised. My, I, I guess my, my personal position would be move toward, towards privatising the whole lot. You know, actually proper privatisation. There's no government control of franchises. You let people bid for stuff, if they go past, someone else takes those, but they control the rails and all the associated services go with it, so it's in their interest to actually run the rails properly. Um, but uh, a lot of people may have other ideas, um, but certainly I don't think a state monopoly is going to be the way to go. And we do actually still have a state monopoly. It's just private companies making profits as well. Uh, Nor order the reaffirm appealing principles. The, you know, the idea of a citizen as, as, you know, as policeman on and of course the policeman as an ordinary citizen who happens to be paid full time to do that damn job. Um, you know, we're getting, you know, we need to get rid of this culture that high vis vest wearing people who feel they can just bully you and muck you about. Um, local elected police chiefs will be part of the strategy obviously because then you have police chiefs who can respond to local concerns rather than governmental policy. Um, DNA retention for convictions because there's something that's in the news and once your conviction is spent your DNA is destroyed as well. Um, repeal as well as non spot fines because they're essentially punishment without trial, so they're quite obviously wrong. Um, Legalising drugs and prostitution, I know prostitution is technically legal anyway, but living off immoral earnings isn't. Um, and you know, uh, legalising drugs, you know, I think, is, a, is, a, is an obvious thing um, because the war against drugs has been lost, it's been incredibly damaging, uh, both for those who take drugs and those who don't take drugs, and thirdly for those who have to pay for it. Um, and uh, all new legislation for sunset clauses. Um, you know, so, right, okay, once it's been enforced for five years, it has to be revisited. Is it still necessary? You know, and uh, no rather than being the perpetrator. <coughs> um, Constitution, uh, Bill of Rights and Common Law to reflect consistency, obviously. Uh, repeal the Human Rights Act. Um, this doesn't uh, uh, conflict with the ECHR, which is you know, the Convention of Human Rights, uh, that was drawn up. Uh, for uh, the saying you must have a minimum, minimum you know, in law protection of human rights. Uh, this country did. It didn't need to be codified in anything like the HRA. Um, because, uh, and there's lots of philosophical, philosophical stuff around rights. It's not the government, the government's, you know, my rights are not the government's gift anyway. To be honest, seeing abuse of the other um, services. Two licenses, um, Repeal of the European Communities Act 1972, which took us into the European Union and established the primacy of European law over, uh, over this country. We've deliberately not focused on get us out of Europe again because we didn't want to be a UKIP. We didn't want to be paid to as a single issue party, but it's quite obvious that to enable you know, most of this manifesto, we have to leave the European Union because you know, an awful lot of these, these subjects we have no control over, or very little control over. And therefore, we could actually enact them if we were still in the European Union anyway. You know, our whole philosophy is you know, friendly agreements with people, but entangling alliances with no one. 
Uh, and you know, frankly, if we're going to have a government, it should be our government, and that should, our government should have primacy, primacy in this country. Um, and strength of ties to the Anglosphere, because you, you're dealing with a similar law, similar culture, <coughs> and similar language, doesn't mean it's all, we're going to be shutting out and outside. It's, it's, the idea is free trade across the, across the spectrum, both within and without. Um, and the review of the electoral system, this comes up in this very you know, topical thing at the moment of the expensive system. Um, obviously, our, our, our ideal is that Parliament is so powerless, and um, so has so little control over our lives, that it doesn't actually matter who the hell's elected anyway. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where people talk about you know, looking at um, you know, standard transferable votes or multiple constituency, multiple MP constituencies, or all these other things. Um, it's something that we need to, need to include. So elections. Um, we have stood in two elections. Um, we stood, um, Andrew Hunt, uh, who's an ex-policeman, got uh, stood in the Whitby South Ward of Cambridgeshire County Council. Uh, the last local election, so seven percent of the vote, which is quite respectable, um, which we thought was, you know, we bought us up, we thought it was quite a good thing, really. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, Thomas Burridge, who stood in the Norwich North by election uh, and got a uh, rather miserable 36 votes. And that was one of the things where we waited till the by election was, was declared until we went and started campaigning there. So we had about two weeks to go and do a whole thing. This is one of those lessons learned that you've got to campaign all year because everyone else is. Uh, and as part of this whole idea of you know, taking it offline and into the real world, if we're going to target constituencies, we've got to be campaigning the whole year round. Um, to be fair, though, I mean, I think that the, you know, generally speaking, national elections, certainly the next general election, I think it's going to be pretty much a straight Tory Labour fight. Um, it's you know, everyone's going to try and get their supporters out in, you know, in order to win that battle. Um, but the national elections, we aren't going to get people elected for a, a good long time. But they do allow us to get some profile in the media. Uh, we do send out press releases on a regular basis and they get completely ignored. Um, when we stood in Norwich, the media had to report us, um, however little that would be. I spoke to, I spoke to at least one guy uh, this morning uh, who heard about us because of the Norwich North by election coverage. Uh, yeah, so, hey, we've got at least one more support for that. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah, so lessons learned from that obviously is you know, local elections probably wants to focus on. It's, you know, we're kind of relearning the lessons that other parties had here. Um, national elections are expensive and they're tough to campaign. I mean, they are expensive. Um, campaign needs to occur all year round, um, but the national elections really do enable MSN coverage. It's the only way we're going to get it at the moment because they just aren't interested. We send out probably uh, you know, a press release every week, every two weeks. Uh, and we're saying to you know, all of the national media and just it. Um, even the local media don't really want to touch it. We aren't seeing it well. <coughs> so, but you know, they have been successful. I mean, seven percent is a reasonable vote in in, Nor in Wisby South, I think. And uh, you know, that was done just by you know, going campaigning, knocking on doors, explaining what the positives were to people. It was a receptive, a receptive vote. Um, people are interested in our, our ideas. They do think the state is too large. They do think they're definitely paying too much in taxes. There is a message we can get out there. Um, obviously, the, the quite big thing was the defection of Gavin Webb, um, who was a Liberal Democrat councillor in Stoke on Trent. Now, he, he's you know, uh, very much a libertarian and has uh, been quite outspoken about it. Um, you might remember he got, got into trouble um, a couple of years ago for uh, saying that actually uh, prosecuting people for driving whilst drunk you know, when they hadn't harmed anyone was, was, was wrong. Um, and uh, I think that he was uh, suspended for that, for that and uh, he defected a couple of months ago. And, uh, you know, he's, so we, actually, we have a, we have a councillor, um, but uh, and, and we, we're obviously looking for. You know, we have had continued growth in membership throughout the UK, um, so it's 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 it's, it's proceeding. Um, we now got roughly a thousand members of the party, uh, about ten grand in, in, in coffers. Um, donations are actually healthy. We don't take donations from businesses. We only take donations from individuals. We're no more corporatist than we are statist. Um, we have no wish to be you no know, tools of big business. Uh, or new tools of status. It's quite an important point, I think. Um, so we do rely on donations from individuals. And to be honest, most of the members just have a sort of standing, standing order and they need for a tenner a month or something. Um, so members you know, have grown pretty steadily, really, um, from about the five that started off to, uh, as I say, just under a thousand now. Um, so it's, it's growing, it's not too bad. A thousand members is, is pretty good, I think, for something that's really had no MSN coverage uh, and it's really about come about online. Um, so donations, obviously, you know, we're doing really, really well. I mean, that graph is slightly sorted by the fact that we've had about £8,000 uh, donation, donation in July to support the Norwich North, 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 North by-election. 
But generally speaking, donations are roughly sort of five, six hundred pounds a month. You know, it's a general rolling running thing. Um, obviously, we always need more. Um, I mean, we started actually. I mean, but January, February, March was kind of where you know where we started. You know, sort of, we were sort of around about hundred pounds a month, and we actually then started doing an appeal, actually appealing for funds, which we've never really done before. You know, just saying, look, we need funds to fight these elections and that, and that kind of thing. We actually need funds to keep the party going. Um, you know, do you feel free to give? And ever since then, we've actually had a reasonable level of donations. Um, just for people, just reminding people that actually. We do keep. We try. We try not to burn through money. We do try to actually, you know, use money wisely. But you know, we really do. You know, it, it costs money to, to run a party. It's, it's all of the, the registration fees and the election fees and the, all of those other things. And you know, introducing, you know, it's great. You, know, you get. You do a by election. You do a national election. You get a free, free poster. You get to send one lot of free flyers up a post. But you've got to print these flyers. Um, you know, and and do all those things. And that, that all takes money. Um, so the future strategy, we're trying to run more professionally, we, we actually want to try and build business cases. Okay, so you know, we want to do, we want to solicit donations. Okay, well what are you going to do with my donations? Um, it's, a, it's quite an important thing. Um, you know, rather than just giving money, what, what's going to happen to it? Um, you know, uh, we're going to try and review the branding the website. Obviously I threw it all together in you know, a matter of weeks when we were setting up. Um, and it's always meant to be kind of reviewed and you know, we'd like to do that since our online presence is so important. Um, we're bringing back off the systems. We've got a guy who's actually writing some you know, customized systems for us, which is, which is great. We've got a lot of techies and media people, actually. And the, generally speaking, the profile of members is, is generally sort of you new, know, around about 30, uh, 30. There's a lot of people who are under, under 30, very quite young. It's actually quite encouraging, I must say. Um, and uh, we're continuing to nurture the branches. That's what we're doing. Um, so the general election coming. Um, we've got about five candidates standing. Um, I also need to concentrate more heavily on the MSN and try and get the message out there and continue to build the online support. Um, how the candidates will do, we don't, we don't know, obviously, but we're actually starting to do the campaigning now. Uh, we're actually doing people going around and campaigning at weekends in, in the, the five constituencies that we select. And we select those five constituencies because we're quite strong in there. We've got enough, enough members to actually do something. Uh, it is a long journey. God knows we're in for a long haul. I hope you might see someone you know, elected within 10 years, who knows. But, um, but we will get there eventually, I and mean, it, it is long haul, but obviously as much support as we can get, fantastic. Um, but, uh, but we are all in for the long haul, so we, we hope it's going to be good. Um, so if you want more information, lpuk.org is the website, or email us at media at lpuk.org. Um, and finally, so that's it really, that's, any questions? Um, Great, thank you. Um, can I just say that, um, as some of you who've been involved with the LA over the years will know, the LA doesn't really have a position on whether there should or should not be a libertarian party. Um, I can only speak personally, but this doesn't reflect on the libertarian lines. Uh, I've always held the view, um, let a thousand flowers bloom, more organisations who talk about our ideas at whatever level, <coughs> intellectually, like the IEA or the Adam Smith Institute or, or the Libertarian Alliance. That's great. If there, are, if there are people who want to set up other organizations involved in politics, you know, who can muster three or five or seven or ten percent of the vote, well, that might have an impact on major political parties. Uh, might, might focus their minds. So, uh, Chris, thank you very much for that. And we've got a few minutes before the first coffee break, so questions. We'll do it by show of hands. Um, and... Uh, when I call people, I think Kelly and those gentlemen here are going to uh, bring the microphones to you so that we can actually hear. So, so I'll come to you. So, is it on? Uh, I wonder if you could give me your views on what I regard as a dilemma. Uh, I, in fact, was involved with the founding of a libertarian party in South Africa. Uh, the dilemma is that as an anarcho-libertarian, uh, there's a strong uh, uh, misbelief in, uh, non-belief in uh, the power of, or the necessity of government, and uh, to form a libertarian party seems to contradict this, uh, this view. Uh, yeah, I, I think our, our advice to that has always been, well, ultimately we want to get, uh, we want to get elected so we can abolish ourselves. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the main point, really. Uh, uh, I, I must say I have very little, uh, I have very little desire to have lots of power over other people. 
um, my first new bike is Fusion. Um, but uh, but uh, that's, I mean, that's always our answer to that. I mean, at the moment we have to work with the framework we, we've got, and um, short of bloody revolution, which we'll all see Vivid Eagle possibly, um, I don't see we can do it any other way. Right, um, I'll be the lady there. Um, I guess this is a sort of follow-on question, but I think what you said about uh, the fact that we have to transition is very important, and I think a lot of libertarians just, you know, want a kind of revolution and suddenly go to this libertarian, but a transition is, I think, necessary. Um, do you have any good arguments to persuade this, probably the majority of, mil of libertarians who don't uh, really take this on board? Um, yeah, I think it, I mean, it's a difficult one, you're right. I mean, I, I'm a libertarian because I believe libertarianism gives the best possible outcome. And so I've always been interested in the best possible outcome. If we switch directly to a libertarian state, it's not going to be the best possible outcome. Um, you know, we will have people starving in the streets, if you like, which I think is probably a bad thing. Uh, probably not so much as look bad, everyone else, it's shocking. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think that if you actually, most people understand that as long as your, your real desire is to become, you know, have that libertarian society at the end of it, um, then I'm, I'm sure that many people, uh, I hope most people, uh, most of the time, would be willing to, to, to understand that there has to be that transition. Because there's no point in um, you know, suddenly bringing a libertarian state on in overnight, finding it doesn't work, and then you, know, you get sort of you know, reactionary status coming back in. You know, it's not going to last. What you want to try and do is build a lasting libertarian society. And the only way you're going to do that is by making it work. And the only way you're going to make it work is by transitioning. Um, you know, it's like the policies we have there, I think, I and mean, we've been criticised for saying they're, they're, not, they're not radical enough. Well, that may be that they are short-term policies to you know, try and get selected now-ish, as it were. Um, we can go radical once we've actually been the first stage of transition, then we can go more radical uh, later on. But the fact is that if you want a bit of society to work, even a less fair society to work, you've got to make sure that, that people are participating. Um, and I think that if we switch to that, it's just going to be a disaster. Uh, Christian Nemitz at the back, over there in the blue shirt. Please keep showing me your hands, indicating if you want to speak. Yes, I see you there. I've got you turning. Yeah, I was wondering whether there is a party position on central banking and on the possibility of denationalizing money. And if so, has that been tried on an audience yet? Uh, <laughs> um, do you know what? It hasn't. We do have a policy on that. Um, we have a policy on uh, having several different uh, currencies, actually. Uh, we have um, what we call sterling, which is a gold-backed currency, uh, where you could choose to put your, you know, which, would, which would maintain its, uh, its value. Uh, then we have the pound, as it were, which is the, which is the fiat currency, if you like, which can be done in everyday dealing, but you, you run the risk that, you know, that, that you, you do things, but it doesn't shit out for a floating currency. Um, so, uh, and we had a couple of ideas around around the currencies on the back as well. Um, the idea really is it is multiple currencies, um, but always having the one currency that is gold backed so it maintains value. Uh, if people want to new, um, uh, new take bank, lo bank, local bank currencies, as it were, and borrow and inflate those currencies, at least if that bank collapses, you haven't got a collapse of the entire financial system. Um, you've always still got the sterling as the gold back, the gold back system there. So essentially, it's, it's, it's local banks issue, you know, well, banks issue their own currencies, people can deal in those currencies, uh, banks can deal in those currencies, but the fact is that you've always got that, that gold back base there if the whole thing goes tits up. That's a technical term, though. Yes, it is a technical term. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> uh, ben Cozen, I like the questions so far because they're brief and concise. Ben, I know you're going to follow on with me. Many points. Concise, uh, one point, point, one question. Uh, the criterion, surely, for policy formation must be that, first of all, it does not directly increase the power of the state. Yes. Secondly, that it does not indirectly lead to increases of the power of the state. Yes. I'm not sure that I've got my head completely around your point about oppo opposing oppressive and discriminatory laws. Now, my understanding of race relations uh, 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 the grievance industry, etc., 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 is that any mention uh, uh, of opposing discrimination uh, is likely to increase uh, the power uh, uh, of all these equalities commissions. If oppression takes, why not uh, oppose only oppression 
discrimination does not matter and opposing it leads to an increase in the power of the state. Well, thank That's you, right. um, <clears throat> Discrimination does matter because it affects free association, uh, which obviously is a libertarian ideal. Um, and the other thing is it doesn't increase the power because, I mean, some of you might know, I also set up a website um, which is a database of charities that are funded by the state uh, called fakecharities.org. Uh, you'll go there and find lots of your favourite charities that are massively funded by taxpayers' cash, including almost all of these crangos and, uh, and charities which deal with discrimination. Remove their funding, they die. So no increase in cuts so far. Excellent. Tony Brown. You didn't mention competition policy and cartelization, aggregations of power, abuse of power, competition policy is in fact fundamental. Do you have a position on competition policy? What is the role of the state on competition policy? And in view of the importance of insurance in what you are uh, uh, proposing, what about competition in the insurance sector? Uh, ooh, good question. Um, uh, I think certainly in a transitional period there's a role for the state in uh, trying to regulate competition, obviously none of us are fans of monopolies. Uh, many people also argue, of course, that it's uh, the state's regulations and barriers to entry that, um, that allow large companies to be established. Some of our you know, more anarcho members also believe that we should remove the, the personality of a limited liability company. Um, it's one of those questions which seems kind of trivial, but actually is one of the most fiercely debated ones in the party, and we haven't actually got a firm policy on that at the moment. Um, it's, it would be mainly, I guess, um, at the moment, it would be kind of the state re you know, regulated competition, removing barriers to market entry uh, you know, through, through regulatory practices, regulatory laws, in any case, hopefully making smaller companies more nimble, uh, reducing the power of the large companies. Uh, and then you know, certainly looking at do we abolish limited liability uh, entities. Tom Burrows. Tom, can you put your hand up so you can indicate to the uh, microphone, thanks. <coughs> um, Chris, what lessons have you learned from the Libertarian Party in the US, given that it's sometimes waxed and sometimes waned? <laughs> Um, yeah, this is what people, uh, one of the questions people sometimes ask. Um, do we, uh, are we in any way affiliated with the, the US Libertarian Party? No, is the answer to that. Because we looked at them and went, well, they've got the same problems as you could have. They keep on fighting each other, uh, rather than fighting a good fight to work. Um, so, uh, as I said, part of the thing we had was, you know, was setting up a small core and trying to grow the party gradually, um, trying to make sure that we had all of the processes in place to try and stop the infighting. That's, the only thing that we can possibly do. I think that um, if you look at the waxing wane of the, the, the US Libertarian Party, quite often it's coincided with the part of their infighting and breaking up. I think a party that does that is so crucial, very, very crucial. That means everyone's got to be on board, but the, the general ideals, even if not the actual manifesto, uh, the actual, you know, some, some people debate parts of the manifesto, but the ideal is still the same, still the Libertarian uh, ones. The, it may be that in 10 years' time we have similar splits, but we're trying to, we're trying to make sure we don't do that. It was one of the big things from the outset of the formation of the party, and that's the only thing we can really do at the moment. Chris Beavis at the back. Hand up, please, Chris. There we are. Microphone. Does the Libertarian Party have a position on intellectual property laws, and if so, what is it? <laughs> um, Again, this is the thing all easy ones, ones to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, mm. uh, again, it's actually quite a first debate. Um, a large part of the party uh, do not like intellectual property laws and the Boris law. Uh, I have a bit of an issue with that personally. Um, uh, it rather depends on what you're into. If I have an idea, is it, is it my property? I mean, I was having a debate recently online with someone and they were going, well, this is what it's intellectual property laws. I was going, right, fine, so but you believe that stealing someone's stereo is fine, but stealing the idea that made that stereo possible is, is no, sorry, stealing someone's stereo is wrong, but stealing the idea that made that stereo possible is, is, is not wrong. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's still an ongoing debate, I have to admit. I'd be happy to take any uh, supplication from, from anyone who has ideas about it or any strong views about it. Um, I, I certainly don't agree with the idea of for instance, US patents, where basically you can sit and go, well, I've got an idea for a robot that does backflips eight times and then makes you a martini. I can't build it, I don't know how it'd be done, but then when someone does actually build it and 
uh, using these oil, even infringe my patent because uh, I had that idea. And said, well, okay, we all have lots of ideas, but you shouldn't be able to do it unless you actually make it work, as it were. Um, the US patent law is, is, is barking and so, um, and uh, <coughs> that's positive. I mean, we, don't, we are working on a policy on that, but it is, again, it's another bone of contention that leads to very, very strong arguments. Um, we have another number of, uh, for instance, uh, Randists uh, who strongly believe in intellectual property rights and, and get very, very, uh, are very, very hot up about it, and a lot of you know, narcos who believe that you know, we're actually better off without them. Again, so it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing development. I'm happy to take, uh, take ideas from people on that one. Right, last question. Who wants to twitch and go to the lady at the back there? More of a comment rather than a question. I just want to congratulate you on thinking through the transitions. And I've heard a lot about uh, what libertarians want, but very little thought seems to have gone into uh, coming up with a transition on arrangements. Okay. <laughs> great. I think that's a great uh, note to end this session on. Um, before we just break the coffee and coffee and tea and biscuits are back in the green room just across the, the hall there. Um, I'm sure you know that there's the think tank room next door, lots of free publications available to you in there, so please go in there and, and, and take what you want. But please take only the things that you really want to read, don't just take things for the sake of, of taking them. But um, uh, one thing I will mention, I'll come back to you later in the weekend on this, for the first time this year, Luther Alliance is going to be hosting uh, a free uh, Christmas gathering, we're going to be calling it. Um, uh, a capitalist Christmas party, um, and it's going to be held in this club, and, and it's going to be two hours of canapes and, and drinking, uh, and it's free to uh, all our supporters. So you'll be uh, hearing more about that, uh, and it'll be posted up on our website uh, later this week. Um, and to launch Capitalist Christmas, we'll actually be posting it um, just prior to December. We can get it early. We're going to be hosting it, we think, at the end of November. So, there we are. Without further ado, can I thank, thank Chris uh, for an excellent presentation. I'm sure some of you are going to sign up to the Libertarian Party. As President of the LA, whatever you choose to do, you have free will. Please don't stop writing for the LA. That's important that we continue to debate these issues and do your publications. And we'll plunge your material as you say. Yeah, yeah, we are. Exactly. So, <laughs> so Chris, thank you very much. That was thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back here.